All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Softcast. This is your host, Star Major Matt Parrish. Today, I'm rolling solo, but I've got an incredible guest for you. When, uh, you, when you've listened to our show, you've heard us talk about preservation of the force and family or POTIF. You've heard us talk about human performance. It's something I'm extremely passionate about, but I will say from the beginning, I think sometimes when people come out and they're, they're having these conversations, it comes across as like, hey, this guy, you know, he, he's an expert or whatever. I will tell you right now, the reason I'm passionate about this is because I was terrible at it as a young guy on a team. I took my youth for granted. I took running hard for mission accomplishment first as team above all else. I will stay on a team. I will never take a knee. I'll never, I will never stop and do anything else. And so now in my, uh, you know, in my twilight or second part of my career, I guess I should say, uh, I'm realizing that like one of the things that I want to do most with my time and, and any rank or influence I have is to try to help the generations behind me not have that same kind of, uh, that kind of, that kind of spirit that leads to the five neck and back surgeries that I've had and all the other things. Right. And so when you, when you find people that are as passionate about something like that as you are, who are doing things at a huge scale, um, I get really excited to bring them on and talk about, talk about these things with them. Right. So today I've got Sergeant first class, Doug Casewetter. He's from 19th group. He's from our national guard, special forces group, but also You've probably heard of him or seen him uh, from Softleet, right? So Softleet is a, I'll let Doug explain it, but uh, an incredible resource for human performance, not just in the physical domain, uh, but really across all of human performance. So Doug, hey man, welcome. Excited to talk to you today, man. Hey, it's great to be here with that kind of billing. I don't know how to live <laughs> up to it. Uh, just to be, just to be clear, I'm actually in twentieth group. Those oh yeah, dudes are they're the worst. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you went there. You know, that's that's funny because the National Guard. I have so many friends in the National Guard, and I just throw nineteenth and twentieth group so interchangeably. So I'm glad that you corrected it. But that's actually well, where I want to go first. Is like, tell me about the hidden jewel that is <laughs> Army Special Forces National Guard because it's a pretty it's a pretty awesome little deal. Everybody expresses incredulity that it exists. You know, I don't. When you start back in like the like the nineties and talking about like the political divisions between the guard and the reserves, and people yeah. just kind of think they're the same thing, and you're like, well, not really. But I think it's great that we have a resource uh, that's so robust. Uh, you know, the other branches all have reserve components yeah. for their special operations. Yep. Um, well, there's no MARSOC reserve yet, but yeah. I'm sure it's coming, right? Sure. But all of those organizations are really kind of a way to mothball guys that are kind of irrelevant, doing other things. They don't stay up on their their key, you know, their metal tasks, as yeah. it were. Um, in the guard, um, it's a limited training basis, yeah. but everybody has had the same experience coming in. We all went through the same special forces qualification course. Most of us fought in the GWAT, yep. uh, less so now, but sure. um, it's a great group of guys. It's a great way to like maintain the brotherhood. There's a lot of opportunities to build strong instructor skills. Uh, some of the real core elements of being an SF guy, I think are greatly exhibited within the National Guard groups. And like, I'm, I'm honestly very proud to be part of guard SF. Uh, that being said, it's given me a lot of time to put a lot of different irons in the fire and softly is one of those irons that yeah. has really, it's become something kind of all on its own. I mean, when we started it, it was, it was me and a Marsat guy and, uh, a former ranger. Uh, there's, there's quite a few of us floating around, but yeah. I mean, we were selling, uh, two different workouts. That's it. You know, workout for a guy that wanted to go to selection, and workouts for guys that were on a team. And uh, we had a good grounding in physical fitness, but when it really comes down to it, I don't think we really grasped how broad the domain of performance was. And I know like you were talking about your career experiences, hey, go hard, go hard, go hard. That was it, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. we all- And then go I mean, harder, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, well, I'm the most relevant person in the room. I need to take care of myself and taking care of myself means beating myself up and yeah. being available to do more work. And I, I think that the organization certainly rewards that kind of behavior. Um, and, you know, it attracts guys that have that mindset, which is great. But uh, you and I both, I'm certain have found ourselves at the point where it's like, wow, the, the, 
the T-72 is out of gas, you yeah, know, like sure. I'm sitting by the yep. side of the road right now and I'm wondering <laughs> exactly like, where am I going to get more gas for this tank? You know, like there's not a gas station around. So we've really branched out into um, like movement and movement literacy yeah. are part of the fitness piece, but resiliency, uh, psychological wellness, emotional wellness, um, those are all important aspects. And I, I know for a long time, guys would like laugh at me when I'd say that. And I'm like, no, man, like, you know, the answer to being in a bad relationship and feeling bad about it isn't to go to the gym and beat yourself up for three hours a day. You're yeah. just adding to your stress threshold. So we started looking at the way we write programming as a method. I mean, every guy in soft for the most part, even guys that are out of shape who feel bad about being out of shape because yeah. <laughs> they used to be in shape. Sure. Uh, those guys still look at the gym as stress relief yeah. and their programming usually isn't actually providing for their highest performance at any given point. So we're working towards building programming that actually it builds guys up yeah. while reducing allostatic load, which I'm sure Jeff's talked about on here, but to dumb it down, if you haven't heard the episode, yeah. uh, allostatic load would just be the combination of all the stressors in your life. And as the allostatic load increases in humans, whether they be operators or, or not, um, that allostatic load results in a lower performance threshold for everything. You know, like if you wonder why you come home from work and you can't talk to your wife or your kids really annoy you, or you want to kick your dog, it's probably because you're <laughs> Yeah. You're stressed out about a lot of stuff. And it can manifest in so many different ways. As a guy that uh, it all fell apart for in kind of late 2018, that allostatic load, if you're not actively managing its ability to come back down, it, it, I even would, I finally was willing to go to the doctor and I kept saying, like, I feel like I walk around already at an eight and it never goes back down. And, and a lot of the yep. traditional military model was just kind of like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll get you a sleep study or something, right? And so some of these, uh, you know, like Jeff Dardia, who you just mentioned, who, you know, we had him and, uh, and Chelsea from Hunter 7 on in season one, um, you know, there are people that have made it their life's work, Softly being one of them, Greg being one of them, Chelsea being one of them, to just put out information, Theo Ballard and all these other folks to say, like, hey, um, we'll put it out there on the on the internet, just come and figure it out. But part of the reason that I want to even have episodes like this is to is to just make awareness that like, hey, sometimes it's going to take some personal responsibility for you. A lot of us, it takes us a long time to get to the point that we're ready to have those conversations, right? And so I think we're doing a better and better job of inculcating it earlier in everyone's career and changing that culture. Uh, what I talk about a lot is that we've we've undergone a significant culture change across soft in the physical domain, um, in the last 10 years, not from a performance perspective, although we've done that as well from the, you're no longer a complete turd for going to the physical therapist when you have a small injury and trying to get it taken care of. Like, I don't know about you, but early on in my career, like anybody that went to sick call was like, Oh man, you're just trying to skate out or whatever. And so dudes just dealt with things and put duct tape on them until they became red line incidents. What we're trying to push in Podif is like, how do we change that culture in your social and family relationships? How do we have a, a similar change for psychological where you take some, you know, preventative steps prior? Guys are not think a dirt they're going to be the ones that fall apart. Yeah, everybody you know, thinks like, they're a unicorn and there yeah, aren't any. And I, yeah. I mean, and in some ways, a lot of us are. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I don't know about yeah. your breakdown, but yeah. for me, mine was 2014. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, it had been building for years yep. and I had no idea. Yeah. And then I just kind of woke up one day and there's some things that were happening. They were just like, uh, I think I'm broken. Like yeah. I just like yeah, yeah. my gym performance was still pretty good, but like I felt pretty depressed. Uh, yeah. Like things that were previously easy were very hard. Yep. My relationships were trash. Um, I just, it was difficult. And I think, you know, <laughs> there's got to be a buy-in, right? So for me, yep my buy-in was that my life was shit. Yeah. And for now, like the thing that we're trying to promote for soft lead is like, Hey, you don't have to wait till your life shit to get, yeah, exactly. get your stuff in order. You know, like exactly. 
And a lot of us are programmed to suffer. I mean, the Q course, the way we came up, the things that motivated us to join the military in the first place to prove to somebody else that we were, you know, we were tough. We were real men. Yeah. Those are all things that uh, you reward endurance. You know, it's like, Hey, I'll just suffer. Resilience. Yeah. Yeah. Determination. Yep. Absolutely. But the, the definition of those things for us has always been suffering (laughs) at its core. Yeah. And so I, I think it's really neat when you can look at it. I mean, and it needs kind of stupid word, but like <laughs> when you can look at the situation and say, oh, like if I engage in some basic preventative care, yeah. if I take care of myself, if I go see the physical therapist, um, like I'll feel better. I mean, I'm 40 now. Yeah. Uh, my numbers on everything are better than they were when I was in my 20s. Um, yeah. Like I feel better, uh, I run faster. I can pretty much engage in any recreational sport I want. So like our our motto is die living, yeah. um, which, you know, means a lot of different things, to a lot of people. But for me, it's really just, I don't ever want to be in a position where my physical or mental health limit my ability to do the fun things I want to do. And, yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. We say the army can ruin anything, you know, like everybody mm-hmm. loves diving. Everybody thinks skydiving is cool, but yeah. dive school sucks. And halo school is stressful because guys want to pass, sure. and, you know, you had to do it with all that gear. Yeah. So that makes it suck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, so instead of looking at fitness and resiliency and, you know, just performance as a whole as another albatross around our neck, it's, I think it's kind of a cool idea that really we can make you a better operator, a better physical specimen and a longer lasting just asset by taking some of the load off. Yeah. Um, and by saying, hey, um, you know, you don't have to train at 100% all the time. A lot of the time, I mean, we have, we program a couple of days a week that, I mean, we we used to sell five day a week programming. Yeah. And everybody bitched. They were like, hey, I paid for programming. <laughs> I don't want two days off. So we had to trick our, our clients into the right stuff by programming, you know, like active recovery day, which sure. a lot of the time is just, hey, man. You need to go out and walk without any load for 90 minutes, yeah. go on a hike, hang out with your dogs, do something with your kids, whatever it is. Yeah. That's one day of programming. And then another day of active recovery will be like movement flow or something more focused to like kind of keep guys a little bit more mobile. Um, most of the guys I talk to that reach a breaking point, they go to like the star clinic or yeah. um, Prep, any of the other yeah. programs. Yeah. They show up thinking the only thing that's wrong with them is that their head's fo- foggy. And then they do like a functional movement screen and they're like, oh, but I didn't realize I couldn't bend at the waist to pick up a pencil, you know? And you're like, yeah, man, it's, it's tough. It's all interconnected. Yeah. You've been focusing on one kind of fitness your whole life and it's made your body really resistant to other modalities that are good for your health. You know, that was exactly me. In fact, I just came out of uh, prep, you know, here at the Tampa VA, which is one of the regional, you know, kind of places that we send folks to be able to get that full body, like stop for three weeks and go through everything. Right. And I just came out of that a couple of weeks ago. And uh, yeah, I went in there thinking, all right, right, there's probably one, maybe two silver bullets. And then once you go through everything, you realize, no, it's like, there's like 10 or 12 new habits I need. Right. And so implementing those, obviously taking small chunks in them, but at least having the awareness that like, okay, these are the things it's not like, all right, there's one pill or there's one different uh, thing. I do want, before we get back in this conversation, one thing I failed to do, which I have to do because we're the official podcast is I'll give a quick disclaimer, right? As Doug and I talk about these things, He's talking about soft lead, right? And and I'll just say that for a legal disclaimer so that the tactical lawyers don't kick in my door, there's no implicit or specific endorsement of his product or any other product from US SOCOM, right? Um, and, and I'll take that a step further in the fact that like I help run the human performance and we spend a ton of money. We're lucky to get a ton of money from Congress to help us put the world's best professionals and strength and conditioning coaches and physical therapists and all these different things embedded into the units, right? There are people- We don't spend with, any of it on us, I'll say yeah, that. Yeah, and we don't spend <laughs> any of it on Softly, right? But what I'll say is there's people that when I talk about, like I use Softly as, a, and as an example sometimes when I go to these different places, when I have this talk, because there's people who are like, oh, well, if you spend that money, or for instance, if you're not in Soft, oh, you're in the Army, you have to use the Army resources for whatever, right? Like why would you possibly be talking about some other resource, right? Well, to me, I want people to be as healthy as possible and as operationally ready as possible, right? And so if you find, I believe that there's there's different 
things that work for different people. And I think if you want to go and use soft lead or you want to go and use whatever else that works for you and doesn't add a ton of stress and all these other things that Doug and I are going to talk about, great. There's no endorsement of any of them. I hope you use the POTIF Human Performance Training Centers. I hope you use our strength and conditioning coaches to help educate you on those movement patterns and things like that. Wonderful. But I do want to have those broader discussions. Uh, and, and again, just from a lawyer perspective, no endorsement, just like I have to do for any of these profit or nonprofits that we bring on. But Doug, coming from Softly, you guys, you guys, I'll tell you how I got aware of Softly, right? I actually thought it was Marsock guys exclusively at the beginning, because that's just where I sort of started hearing the buzz about it, right? And I saw some of the selection prep programs and some of the other stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. These guys are like getting after it, doing whatever. You guys got great marketing and branding, all those t-shirts and everything. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. But I thought it was all physical. Right. For, I mean, for the, at the beginning, it, it really was. And that's I mean, how it was for POTIF, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. We, we didn't know better. Yeah. And we've learned as we went along. I think it's a really good point that you make about like army resources. Sure. Um, I think that people see people see a solution and they think that there is a best solution. Sure. And yeah. for me, I don't I mean, I'll, I'll show my age, but I grew up watching Miracle on 31st Street yeah. or four, 34th yeah. Street or whatever, right? <laughs> that showed your age I mean, more. <laughs> yeah. The idea the idea that Santa Claus at one at, at Macy's sent people to Gimbel's to buy Christmas gifts always sure. seemed crazy. Yeah. But for me, it's like, hey, uh, like I refer guys to other yeah. programs All a lot. I mean, yeah. and the more we've developed a more robust product, the less I have to do that sure. because I, I have resources right. where I'm like, hey, you should try this thing or, yeah. or whatever. But um, like we don't have a one-stop shop, but if you look, I, I, I'll tell an anecdote. I, we started talking to some people at Fort Jackson about potentially helping the army develop their own app because sure. the army loves to do things internally, but they want to look and see if somebody's done it better and they can just yeah. buy it. Yeah. Um, obviously those talks didn't go anywhere, yeah. but the thing that I found interesting about it was I talked with a lot of the master fitness trainers at Jackson who yeah. are really smart, educated guys in the realm of like human performance. But they're dual and, uh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, and, yeah. and they're training people who aren't experts. Right. And they're trying to disseminate that information. So it's like, hey, come to a three-week course or four-week course. We'll teach you all about human performance. And you're like, no, man, this is, this is a lifetime <laughs> pursuit. Yeah. And you can give a guy the wave tops in a class, but you can't expect him to teach it like right. he's an expert later on. So, exactly. I mean, you know, I was a pretty good 18 Charlie until I came to teach at the 18 Charlie committee. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, it took me a year really to get to the point where I was a really good instructor. Sure. And when I left the committee, I was like, Oh, I'm actually, I was a terrible 18 Charlie before, but <laughs> like, I'm a really good one now yeah. and teaching it and becoming a subject sure. matter expert goes a long way. But the guys at the master fitness trainer thing were laughing because doctrinally, the way the master fitness trainer thing is set up, they can't write programs to prep people specifically for tests. And from a fitness standpoint, we don't do that either. We yeah, believe sure. that general physical yeah, yeah, yeah. preparedness means that you should be ready to take yeah. an APFT or an ACFT cold any day of the week. Absolutely. Yeah. But we also recognize from marketing standpoint yeah. that, uh, yeah. you know, like people are stressed about a test. So yeah. we put together a really short, workup for the ACFT yeah. and we were giving it away as a PDF, as a marketing, like generation lead. Yeah. And, uh, it was funny. It was like our most successful lead generation campaign we've ever run. Yeah. And that prep program was like on the wall at the master fitness trainer thing, because they were like, we can't write one and give it to our master. Well, we can photocopy trainers. this one. <laughs> yep. We can photocopy it and give it to the guys and tell them if you, if you got somebody that's nervous yeah. and wants to do it, use this yeah. thing. And for us, I mean, those short programs are really a way to push someone into a more like a longer term periodized program that focuses on building the athlete without breaking the athlete down. Yeah. And a lot of the courses we go to are, are kind of meant to break guys down sure. to see how they handle mental and physical stress. But the way that you train shouldn't be breaking you down and hurting you, you should be building yourself up for the work you want to do. I think that's one of our, one of our biggest issues. And, I, and I'll, I'll lay it at NCOs in this case, because you and I both are right. Um, I think we go through these incredibly stressful and a very hard schools for special forces and for any of our other components. 
and it's the only way that we can try to induce some level of similar stress to what people are going to face in combat is, all right, put them on a time limit, give them no food, give them no sleep. Like you have to find external ways. Manufacture stress. Yeah. We have to manufacture that stress. The problem is, is that's what you then learn as a young guy is like, okay, for training, we manufacture all this stress and whatever. (laughs) And then as you said, like later on, that's what you end up writing sometimes into a lot of your stuff. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't manufacture stress as you're training and whatever. There are parts of your training schedule where you should manufacture that stress. But we get into the point of like, we've manufactured stress in training or, or, or in our qualification. Then we manufacture stress in training and it becomes our normal aspect. So things like sleep and whatever else, then we start getting to where like, no, 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 no. Yeah, sleep when we're dead because yeah, I've already been, I've trained. I was qualified yep. that I can go without sleep. Now I've trained my whole life that I can go without sleep. So now we're going to go into where I, I just sleep is not important. We're not going to plan for it. We're not going to do anything else. And that's fine in a short term. The problem is when you have 20 years of a career or GWAT or et cetera. Um, that's it's an where evaluative I tool, yeah, right? I mean, exactly. that's the point is yep. like stress introduces outside forces that that allow you to better evaluate someone. Yep. But when it comes to like, uh, building yourself up and having a really fulfilling life, it doesn't make sense that you're building a house like one day and the next day you got a 20 pound sledgehammer and you're breaking the center blocks that you, you know, the bottom out. It's just, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. I mean, we, and you also we know at, when you're going to sell that house, right? As opposed to us, absolutely. you got to be ready to sell that house any day, right? There's well, a, and, yeah. and honestly, it doesn't matter if you're selling the house or not. There's yeah. no point in, unless you laid the foundation wrong there's no point in ripping it up and i think a lot of the time we just we laid we've laid all of us this is not like an indictment on anybody in particular but we've all laid a pretty shaky foundation because we've looked at the way to build the foundation is to deny ourselves rest to you know to push to the objective but (laughs) this is a much broader point (laughs) but i don't think that we as individuals are much better than our broader institutions at defining a clear end state as to what we're working towards. Sure. And if you don't know what the end state is, then you're really, really uncertain as to what the right next step is in developing yourself for the mission at hand. Yeah. And SF guys as a whole are really good at operating in nebulous environments and doing both wrong and right things that contribute to mission accomplishment. Right. Yeah. Usually the reward is there because yeah. you know at the end of the day you're like, well, we did this good thing, and we don't right. talk about all the other stuff that went into doing sure. the good thing. Um, so as well, athletes, and we yeah we elevate the fact that you're willing to burn your body and everything else to the ground for that mission accomplishment. That's what we see in the comprehensive review and other things where you know we see some of these cultures of you know win at all costs. And when I say win at all costs, I don't mean like just strictly in an ethical uh, sense. I mean uh, you know. Uh, like I said, the, the work life ability, like, um, uh, my 06, my director for POTIF, we and I have this conversation all the time. And when he was at the war college, you know, all the army 06, you know, leaders go up there and they would have these gofos, you know, general officers that would come in and give, and everybody at the end of their career, just like, you know, we're doing with this was like, you got to have a work life balance. You got to be able to set these things aside. And they would say, you know, I've, I go on a date night with my wife once every, you know, whatever, once every two weeks or whatever. And there was like this one, my, my, uh, Colonel always says there was this one Oh six that would get up. And every one of those people that said that would be like, okay, sir, two things. One, uh, does your staff get that same because they're the ones setting all that up. And two, yep. If you had done that for your entire career, would you be where you're at now? And we all know it's not, right? We all know I mean, that I don't, you have to burn I, so it down. I, yeah. I will say this. I don't yeah. know that to be true. Yeah. Um, and I I am lucky. I was a guard bum yeah. at the beginning of my career. Which yeah, explain a guard bum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just chasing deployments sure. in schools nonstop. I, if you looked at my my military resume from the time I joined until about 2014, it was cobbled together orders with maybe like five days between order sets. Right. Uh, I had, uh, I mean, I guess I had nine years of time in service when I had my my real wake up call. Yeah. And I had like eight years and eight months of active duty time. Right. <laughs> and because of that, you end up never taking leave. Right. You never do anything as a break because it pays more to, you know, like figure out like, oh, I'm going to sell that back and I'm going to jump back into another set of orders because like regular employment's better for me. Yep. And I think 
um, much like a CrossFit workout. That's like, you know, you come out of the gate super hard and you're trying yeah. to beat other people and you don't have good pacing yeah. that a lot of the time earlier in our careers, we look at it that way. It's like, I'm going to come out of the gate really hard, yep. but you then run out. You're like, Oh, well, I don't really know where I'm at in this. Like, where am I at pacing wise? Is my rep scheme good? It's not, <laughs> yeah, your, yeah. It's, it never is. Sure. Uh, yeah. So like, I think that it's worth noting that for, for a while when Softly was young, a lot of the younger dudes would always message me and be like, Hey, I hear what you're saying about meditation yeah. and like doing some long, slow distance. But like, I, I am on a team and I yeah. can't do that. And I'm but like, you yeah, can. Man, yeah, yeah, I'm on a team yeah. too. Yeah. And I choose to prioritize my time a little differently now, instead of, you know, coming back and like, yeah, after a mission, I'll hit the defect. I'll eat some food. But instead of staying up with the boys watching a movie yeah. or pounding you know, beers, uh, yeah, yeah, well, cracking a <laughs> non-alcoholic frosty beverage, you know, or ten. Yeah. Um, now I'm like, hey man, like I really need to focus on like down regulation. I need to get yeah. a good five to eight hour block of sleep while I can. Uh, prioritize the things that I need to do when I wake up, so I don't wake up yeah. and just wander around for three or four hours taking a shower wasting time cruising on the internet. Right. If I'm going to talk to my significant other, like I need to schedule it yeah. so that it's a normal engagement. So it's not like me going three weeks uh, or, yeah. or months. Yeah. <laughs> like my, my 2011 Iraq rotation was the busiest thing I've ever done because we were shutting the country down. Yeah. And I, I don't think I talked to my wife, but every, like every other month, yeah. You know, I mean, it was just yeah, like, yeah. it wasn't a priority for me. Right. And honestly, that's probably one of the reasons I ended up getting divorced yeah. after yeah. a lot of, sure. you know, yeah. trying and trying yeah, yeah, yeah. and trying. But I mean, yeah. people are afraid that if they go to talk therapy, they're going to be stigmatized as being mentally ill and they're not going to be on a team. Yeah. And, you know, your first three sessions of talk therapy, you might feel like you're mentally ill and you don't belong <laughs> on a team, but you're probably going to have a breakthrough at some point and you're going to go back to the team room and every dude's going to look at you and be like, Hey, yeah. why are you so happy? Like right. what's, you know, what happened to you, man? Yeah. Like, did you, uh, did you get a new girlfriend or yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, no, no man, I'm actually like, just taking care of myself. <laughs> yeah. I did some childhood trauma work and like, <laughs> I just uh, felt like there was a yeah. hundred pounds taken off my shoulders and like coming into work isn't stressful to me anymore. Cause I actually yeah. appreciate you guys. And I like right. my job. Um, yeah. but when you're, really deep in the problem yeah. and you don't have ways or, or methods to get out of it. Yeah. You never think that you're in the problem at all. Yeah. You just think everything else is the problem. Yeah. Well, and, and that it, it goes back and, and all we're talking about is problem, problem, problem. Right. But it's, it's, it's a result a lot of times of the fact that we have people that are so incredibly resilient and resilience is a muscle that as you work it, it, the feedback loop comes back to you. Like we talked about earlier that oh, I can overcome this. I can be confident that I can forsake everything else. And so as you do that, where others might have stopped earlier in that process of being in the weeds and been like, all right, hey, I wrote, I'm i at my breaking point. You just continue to sort of kick it down the road. And as you said, you get deeper down into the valley where suddenly you're realizing like, oh no, I am in the middle of this problem. I didn't even realize I was there. I didn't realize, for me, I didn't realize um, the lack of you know mobility that I had from what I was doing. Well, I didn't realize I the we lack. Were, yeah. Go ahead. We were all programmed to think that stress inoculation is the only tool <laughs> yeah, to build the best. resiliency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so like when, and we didn't know anything about cortisol yeah. saturation yeah, or yeah. endocrine failure that comes from that. And yeah. now it's like, well, Hey, you're right. We talk about a lot of problems. The solutions to those problems don't start. They, they don't start and finish quickly. They, if you, the earlier you start them, the less work you have to put into them. Yeah. And so like, yeah. if you do yoga once a week, yeah. starting at the beginning of your career, like yoga is yeah. hard and it's not actually always yeah. that fun. I'm in, like, I'm in it, man. <laughs> yeah. But if, if you do it yeah. consistently, even as just a, an accessory work thing, yeah. uh, you don't ever have to worry about all of, like how bad you'll be at it when you're 40, yeah. you know, it's like, I get a lot of mobility. My muscles are less prone to injury. My joints are healthier. I'm just happier because I spent an hour away from my phone. Like yeah. We're all so connected now yeah, yeah, that yeah. It, you can't escape your work responsibilities, but choosing to do something yeah. like meditation where your phone is shut off um, yeah. or, or at least your notifications are shut off while yeah. you're doing it or choosing not to be on your phone an hour before you go to bed and reading a book, you yep. know, I mean, yeah. we see a lot of these things like 75 hard where it's like, Hey, 
you you're really you're kind of piece of trash you haven't done any of the right things so for 75 days do all of them yeah, every yeah, day yeah, yeah. and i'm like yeah. i don't know man that's that seems stressful to me like, <laughs> yeah i'm trying to lower stress my, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. but if you introduce new behavioral traits like new bad patterns yeah. on a daily basis it's really pretty easy it doesn't really take yeah. away from what you're doing and i think people find out that the results are i mean the proof is in the results yeah if if you're running faster, you're feeling healthier, you have a lower incidence of injury, you yeah. just feel happier. Um, like it's normal to feel depressed. It's normal yeah. to not feel like everything you're doing is working right. And we've been trained for so long that because we're, I mean, we're tough guys. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we are yeah. like for lack of a better explanation, sure. not just us, but like a lot of guys in the regular force are oh, really yeah, 100%. tough guys too. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. But because we're tough, we can't like we've been programmed culturally to not say I have a problem yeah. or I don't feel well. My reactions to everything, my emotions for years were like anger and and more anger. Like Yeah. The uh, emotional palette is uh is pretty black yeah. and white. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now I can just say, Oh man, dude, I'm really angry. I wonder why. And then I'm yeah. like, Oh yeah, well, there's other yeah. things going on, and really yeah. my anger is a result of like, I've been running too hard. I'm yeah. stressed out. I don't have a goal right now that I'm working towards. So I'm frustrated. You yeah, know? yeah. It's like, how, how do I solve that? And I think when we built out the soft lead app, which there's another stressor, cause we're not tech guys. So we're, yeah, we're sure. learning how yeah, to yeah. do that aspect in itself. Sure. We started adding more things that I think we thought were value adds that Pete would encourage people to buy our product. But what we were really doing was creating a holistic fitness approach right. that involved nutrition, uh, you know, your actual working out, but also like we introduced, you know, Kim's games, like, like memory sure. yeah, enhancement. Yeah. yeah and we're meditation. doing a ton of stuff cognitively that, uh, you know, guys, guys are willing to come in and talk about their brain and performance wise. Uh, more than they're willing to come in, but it, it, there's a stepping stone. Obviously, there's not some part of your brain that you know. Well, there is in a way with lobes, but but let's just say brain <laughs> yeah. wise, like we're not smart enough to yeah, understand what those behavioral parts of the brain health. Are. Yeah, behavioral health <laughs> is not like a completely different body part than uh you know than your cognitive performance, right? And everything being interconnected to it, it's one of the biggest reasons that we across SoCom are leaning so hard into cognitive is. You know that Kim's game that I used to do as a as a as a as an engineer as well. Like, okay, we do that Kim's game every once in a while. Like, all right, cool. But am I actually taking that and, and trying to put it into a training plan to make me better? Because do I actually want to make better decisions faster? And if I do, then we have the re we have the resources to be able to train you uh, to do that. It's just you you got to reach out to them. I, I will say one thing before I throw it back to you. I'm encouraged, and I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in your in your thoughts on this. I'm encouraged to, uh, you know, as you and I sit here at about similar time, times in service and all that stuff, looking back and like, we can identify all the problems because we've both been through all the weeds. And now we both like at different times and in different ways had sort of the awakening to like, oh man, there's a lot of interconnected stuff that I wasn't, I didn't care about at all. I'm encouraged as I look back into the force that as we keep moving these things further and further left, I think the next generation is better at this than we are. I think because they're starting well, to get talked about earlier. We made it cool. Right. Like that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And honestly, when yeah. I earlier, when we first jumped yeah. on, I told you, I was like, Hey, I never understand why anybody at command wants to talk to me like in a positive <laughs> way. Cause like yeah. I am, I, I am, I'm the, the rebellious NCO, like sure. I'm a problem for most of my leadership, but I get results. And sure. yeah. um, the insouciant, nature of ncos like we're, we're out here causing problems to get things done right but the reality is if you want to make a difference it has to be cool and yeah. like i'm not embarrassed to say that the culture we've built at soft lead is really cool and I, yeah. I really like what we're doing and it's attractive to younger guys yeah. when we say hey man this stuff has value yeah. people listen and i know that when i came up the people that i respected didn't tell me that these things had value. Right. They told me that privation was the only value. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. hey, if you want to be tough, you're going to be dumb. You yeah. know, and you're like, man, I can do both real well. I'm dumb and tough. <laughs> uh, man, have I got the right guy for you? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I mean, I think that you mentioning behavioral health is a really yeah. important thing to talk yeah. about 
because the just the fact that we talk about behavioral health at all yeah. people immediately are like hey that person has a problem you go to behavioral health because you want to talk to a psychiatrist and the yeah. psychiatrist knee jerk reaction is going to solve your problem with medication yeah. and that medication is going to have side effects yeah. that make the things that you love harder to do your yeah. dick might not work or yeah. you might have a harder time reaching you know completion yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah, yeah. um and guys are scared of that and yeah. rightfully so when the real problem is that they've been building a set of coping mechanisms to stay in the fight for so long. And those coping mechanisms are not healthy. Like yeah, I was going to say from, the side effects from the current approved uh, coping mechanisms yep. like alcohol are not much better than, uh, yeah, than alcohol and like yeah. side girls and whatever yeah. else it is yeah, that yeah. distracts you from or, or risk seeking, Yeah. Further risk seeking behavior because you need that adrenaline fix. I've, I've been there uh, plenty and of times. And yeah. that's not an NCO specific problem. Yeah, sure. That is, and that's not I a mean, soft specific problem either. But yep. although we just sort of see more of a prevalence in it, I think I think making it cool, critical. I think also um, making it normal as part of the soft profession of arms, right? Like you, you, you learn these things now more in the Q course because as a like all you want to do is assimilate, right? Like you remember going through the Q course. I yep. heard you on uh, Mentors for Military podcast, by the way. Uh, shout out to those dudes because <laughs> you walked through exactly. I was listening. I was like, that's exactly how I felt. Like every phase of the Q course was the hardest thing I'd ever done, and all I cared about was like, am I going to get cut? Am I going to get cut? Am I going to get cut? I don't even know. Like, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, 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 yeah, the whole time, right? <laughs> and everything was just like, okay, what it, what are they doing? Like, what do I need to change? to be like them and the same thing when you get to your first team room like okay I guess this is what being a Green Beret is okay I'm going to be that right and so the more we make those positive changes there's a gap there where there's a lot of the current population that are in some phase of this but the more and more we can pump that into the newer dudes that and gals now that that hey man this is what it means to be a Green Beret this is what it means to be, to be a SEAL this is what it means to be whatever is you have to work on all of these things so that you don't end up in flames at the end of it. You know, I really like dudes as a gender neutral. I, I do too. Uh, Some people take so offense to it. I think I think dudes <laughs> is a is everything, but there's a few out there who take offense yeah, to it. I, I refer mean, to it, females and males as yeah, dude all the time. I, I, and I, I refer to my two daughters <laughs> as dudes uh, yep. all the time, along with my son. Yep. So it's certainly a, uh, a, a a you know pejorative of love, but. The, uh, yeah, I, mean, I just think, I think making it cool and making like there, there's a reason people want to come to soft, right? One of those reasons, uh, not the top one, certainly, but one of them is like, Hey, they take care of their people. And there's, there's a, there's a profession of arms around it. Like you, you get to go to the range more often. You have physical therapists, you have all these things. And part of that has done a really good job of injecting money there where I think it, it needs to be, I, the problem, right. Is like. Yeah. With a lot, you got a boatload of money. Where does it go? Like, what is the priority? And it's how are you going to make people all utilize labor. those resources? Yeah, that's the, that's, I'll tell you right now. So I can answer that question because I'm the POTIF guy, yep. right? Almost all labor. Like there's so little overhead. So, so what the, a common misconception is as far as POTIF, I didn't know this until I got in this job is I thought like, okay, all the stuff in the human performance training center, uh, you know, all that equipment that's bought by POTIF, right? Like, no, it's not. Right. Like oh, who that, buys that? That's, that's all that's unit. Yeah. Unit O and M. We can get like all deep into okay. all those things. But all of that money that we say when we have like a hundred million dollar uh contract across uh, you know, hundred million dollars a year, uh almost five hundred across the FIDEP or the five year plan, that almost is all professionals. It's all labor, right? And so when is I get being, I get people that, that come and push me, like, hey, I got this great new widget, and I'm like, listen, man, I'm trying to make sure I have enough psychs at yep. first group so that we can fix that access to care issue that's going on right now. Or I'm trying Is to make sure yeah. into a bigger picture too. Like that's actually something like, you know, like are, are the psychs talking to like your primary care provider as well within the yes. system? So they, so because of the weird way POTIF is set up, I don't control those people right? The okay. unit controls those people. So I'm a resourcing arm for that overarching POTIF to say, all right, here's your resources, resources being people, right? So the way we tried to stem the tide, you know, the whole, the whole reason POTIF started was like 2010 or so, all this fraying on the force after 10 years of war, right? And the, the answer was, let's hire the best people in the world and embed them as close to the problem as possible. So from all these different domains, how can we hire incredible strength coaches, put them out there, right? Now, depending on where you are in the enterprise, 
Hey, not every one of those labor people is the greatest person on earth, right? Like I say, they're the greatest people on earth because by and large they are, right? But there's an occasion just like in, as SF guys, there's people that, uh, you know, that, that hire and miss and we got to replace and do whatever. But the point of there's it- There's always a turd in a punch bowl. Yeah. The point of it is <laughs> and sometimes they make sorry major, but anyway, uh, you know, and sometimes they give them a podcast, but no, nice. uh, when, the when you get down to the end there, it's really about just getting people, right? And so- if I had the money to then layer on top of all these other things like programs, that would be great, but, but we don't. Right. And so there's a, there's a yin and yang. You ask a good question. Like, how do we get people, how do we make sure people use it? Right. And so that is the ever change, like culture change part of my job. Um, because, uh, I think it's unique. I don't want to say uniquely American. I think Americans have two scoops of, if you tell me to do it, I'm not going to do it. Right. And right. soft guys and gals now have like five scoops of it. Right. So if I were to make all of that mandatory, if I was like, hey, you must go to POTIF to do everything and you must go every day, you must check in with something, it would be the worst thing possible I could do. Everyone would I be like, that. well, now, like, I'm never going to do it because I was that guy. I spent 13 straight years on a team and anything you told me to do, I, it was, I was, I felt contractually obligated to find a reason to argue with you about everything, right? And so now my my trouble up here is like, how do we create a culture and how do we create value to those folks to where they want to use it? And, and they can use it in conjunction with Softly, they can use it in conjunction with CrossFit, they can do whatever, but how do we get them to, uh, the big culture change for, for me, and I just had a big talk with all of our providers and, and we, we talk to them uh, every once in a while. My thing for POTIF, what I want it to be and what we're trying to change as far as the culture is like when I was on a team, I felt like all of my helping agencies were looking for a crack in my armor as a reason to pull me off a team. And and what I say is like when you're a kid that's running a four four forty or whatever, and you get you get recruited to Alabama or Georgia Go Dogs, then you don't you don't have people that are trying to take you off the field on Saturday. Your whole helping staff is trying to make sure that you're optimally going to perform, and they're trying to get you on the field on Saturday. And that's where we want to change it. We want we want our providers to show that value, but we also want our people, our Green Berets, SEALs, combat controllers, Raiders, whatever, to feel like everybody that's being put in place here is trying to keep me on a team because we know that's the number one motivator. It was for me, you know. When it's time to go and be on the field, yeah, uh, these players and these sports, yeah. they don't have a lot of distractions. Yeah. And I think that one of the most important things that I've learned through this like performance journey is the idea that we all have very limited mental and emotional bandwidth. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. so like when you're, I think that a lot of time, especially I think the thing that drains guys a lot is that they put this hyper focus on their job. That's where their, their most bandwidth is allocated. Yeah. And the other things that are happening in their lives are slowly reducing that hyper focus on on their job. Yeah. So by the time it's time to do the job, you know, yeah. <clears throat> the wife, the kids, sure. the, you yeah. know, family issues, whatever are yeah. distracting Money, enough. Yeah, all kinds of things. It's yeah. really hard to do your job. Yeah. And I tell guys, if there is but one motivator, and I know this is going to ring hollow to a bunch of dudes, but I'm going <laughs> to beat the drum anyway, right? <laughs> Uh, I just went through the VA process for disability. Yeah. Like I'm in the guard. Yeah. One of the cool parts about being in the guard is that you have a DD-214 and you're eligible to receive VA benefits when you're not actually on orders, right? Oh, okay. So yeah. interesting. I mean, I probably should have gotten a VA rating like seven years ago. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> know that. Pro- you're, you're teaching me yeah. something. I didn't even know you could do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so they prorate your VA rate, your, your VA disability money based on the days that you drill. So they take sure. it away yeah, from yeah, you yeah. for those days. But yeah. guys and, and me especially, like I came in to the guard with a bunch of old dudes that were in the guard. Like yeah, yeah. Vietnam. I mean, I honestly yeah, yeah. My, one of my first NCOs was uh, yeah. Mac V Sog dude. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's in 2005. That's awesome. yeah. So like yeah. figure that out. Right. Yeah, He's dude's long in the tooth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's but awesome. All of those guys were like, Hey man, whatever you do, keep track of your medical records. Cause yeah. it'll matter later. And I went through the VA appeal yeah. process, like where the, you know, filing yeah, yeah, my yeah. claim. And I was like, it's a shoe in. I've got all yeah. of this stuff. Everything's wrong with me. Yeah. I filed it all. I went in for my appointments. The PA was like, yeah, those things are wrong with you. And then they denied me about 80% of my claims because they they couldn't see a service connection in my medical records because I was downrange where there weren't medical facilities. Sure, yeah. And I was too lazy to file the yeah. SO600s that I had 
yeah. when I filed my claim. Yeah. So I went back and filed a supplemental claim. It got adjusted. I, I we're in that process yeah, right yeah. now, but I tell guys like the resources we have in soft, especially now with like POTIF being this integrated medical yeah. thing, keep track of what you're going and getting done. Yeah. Like even if it's just writing it in a green leaders book, yeah, so that you have a frame of reference yeah. later. So you can go back and be like, I know this thing happened. Yeah. And Jeff's a huge yeah. proponent of like your, your timeline of service and yeah, it's yeah. all great, but reconstructing that later on is yeah. hard. And I think it's one of the things that, that I really like about what we're doing as a company is like, Hey, we've been there and done that. The products we're putting together are based on our, the bruises and broken bones that yeah. I have from being an idiot. And like, I know that when I came through, the internet was not as you know prolific as it is now. Sure. But I mean, I was on professionalsoldiers.com looking yeah. for every bit of G2 I could or get. Reading books. About what the, yeah. Yep, I was reading Vietnam. Like. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Chosen soldier. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. Let me see what the whole process is yeah, like. Yeah. And you know, nowadays there's way more information out there that's real yeah. and productive and good. And if you're coming through the pipeline or you're a younger soft dude, you should be looking around and going, hey, uh, this is not a problem for me today, but all these dudes are saying that it will be a problem for me. <laughs> exactly. So like I can either ignore it and yeah. say I'm different than that pussy yeah. or yeah, yeah, yeah. I can say I'm the one hey, unicorn, not like yep. any of the 3,500 case studies I have before me uh, yep. that, that this and is all so going like, to blow hey, up. Yeah. Take a page from somebody else's book and you know, you don't, you don't have to do software programming. I think it's the best, yeah. <laughs> but if you don't, then like, I'm, I'm not going to fight you in the street over it. But what I will say <laughs> is that, you know, we have a broad array. I just as a, an aside, I know that yeah. we go downrange to deploy, maybe whether it's a JSET or an actual like full deployment yeah. and you got infinite time to work out. You got good yeah. gym facilities yeah. and guys usually fill that time up with three or four hours a day in the gym because they don't really have a lot else to do. Sure. And I got burned out. I, my last deployment, I yeah. was doing 90 to 120 minute workout cycles and I had all the time. Yeah. I was doing all the right rest stuff. I switched to a 45 minute to 60 minute workout cycle yeah. and all my numbers went up. I felt more rested. I was yeah. motivated to be in the gym. And I think that when you write your own programming or when you follow the lead, like we all look to the experts. I'm like, sure. Hey, I want to do the workout program that that guy who's better than me is doing. Cause I sure. want to be as good as he is. Yeah. And I think that it's n interesting to note that like every one of us has capabilities that are above the average bear and we can develop those. Sure. But where we are in our cycle of capabilities and what's best for us varies. And so I think one of the nice things about like Thor three wasn't that Thor three was a workout facility for everybody to go to every day and get coaching, Yeah. but you had experts who could identify gaps yeah movement patterns yeah yeah yep. like hey man you got a problem yeah you should do this one thing that you haven't been doing yeah, and yeah. if you look at those resources as a way to help you get better on your own time and exactly. not just as some extra block of time you have to fill during the day yeah. you know i'm already doing all this other stuff like i have to do sharp training and i got to do like you know information assurance and yeah. whatever else like yeah man your day's full i get it yeah. But don't look at it like that. Look at it as this is a way that actually take things. It doing things smarter takes work off your plate. Sure, it yeah, doesn't yeah. put it on. You know, yeah, yeah that was one. I you know, and and talking about Thor three, which if anybody's listening from outside of USASOC, that's the that's the sort of army specifically SF, uh, you know, kind of enclave of POTIF. POTIF's called something different, in every one of these units it used to cause some friction because like congressperson would go down to whatever unit and they would get this great brief about Thor 3 or whatever, and they would come back and shoot an RFI down like, hey, why are we paying for POTIF? This Thor 3 thing sounds awesome. It's like, no, 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 it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but w the reason, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because the reason this was, and it was long before me, right? I was on a team running around doing all the wrong things, but it, the reason they went in this model where it's like all contracted labor to try to get those people to help be like kind of the sensor out there is to try to do the opposite of what the army ended up doing with master fitness, right? Where you like try to make it another job on guys and gals who already have too many jobs. Like yep. it, it being a partial duty to be the expert on fitness is, is not something that we want to do. Like every person should be 
trying to be an expert in their own human performance, but having an expert embedded down there, like I said, I, I'm agnostic because I, I don't work for any of those programs. So I can say, hey, I, I don't get any money. I don't have anything. I'm agnostic to what program you use, but I want you to have a resource there at your unit that you can go bounce things off of. If you want to do their programming, because our guys and gals, they'll write you a program, great. If you want to use your own program, don't be afraid to go get that expert tooling, especially if you've got a movement pattern or something where you're like, to look at it. Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure right now. Like you, you know, we all know if you film me in the air when I'm skydiving or you film me in the gym, it's going to look completely different than what I think I'm doing. Right. Like, no, I wasn't you look back, perfect. Yeah, I wasn't Until backsliding. I wasn't backsliding. <laughs> and then you're like, well, who's that guy going across there with your helmet on? Like, oh, well, okay. And it's the same thing when I'm doing deadlifts or whatever else. So like, what do you mean I'm not hinging well? Like, I feel like I'm doing it great. And they're like, all right, well, let's try this, man. And they're like, oh, no, now I feel what a hinge is supposed to be. Like, wow. Well, I think it's, yeah. I think it's, I think it's worth making a footnote as well that, like, I actually think that the Master Fitness Trainer program at its highest level is actually a really awesome yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, program. Yeah. But I think it's funny because the way we handle human resources in the military is so poor yeah. that, like, the right people don't usually end up sure. getting the training. And even if the right people do, yeah. the army doesn't necessarily provide them with the right resources to be yeah. successful. So they expect that because a guy understands the basic tenets yeah. of movement that he can now speak articulately on, you know, developing resiliency, yeah. the importance of accessory work, yeah. strength and stamina balance in your training. Yeah. And you're going, I mean, yeah, he can hit the wave tops, yeah. But now you want to tell that guy, hey, I expect you to sit down and write three unique programs for 200 service members in your unit. Yeah. Like, I, we, you know, we have different ability levels and different focuses sure. based on the sections. So we want you to write all these programs. Yeah. That guy has never written a program in his life. And he has and a so, real job. <laughs> yeah. So like, okay, an extra duty and responsibility, yeah. I understand in the army. It's going to yeah. go on your NCOER and yeah, it's going to yeah. look good. But we don't really have a metric with which to measure whether yeah. that job was successful. Yeah. And we certainly aren't giving the guy the tools to be successful. Sure. So it becomes a really like, it's, it's actually hard to be successful in that realm. And that's one reason why I just tell guys like, Hey, uh, I mean, guys are always like, I like doing this. I'm like, Hey, cool, man. You're not rich froning. Yeah. If you train the only things that you like forever, you're actually hurting yourself. Sure. So do the thing you like, feel good about it. Yeah. And when that 12 weeks is over, yeah. Do the thing you don't like for another 12 weeks sure. and yeah. then get back to me and tell me how you feel about it. And for 12 weeks, they're cursing my name. Yeah. Like, I hate this dude. This is the worst <laughs> thing. And at the end of the 12 weeks, they go back to doing what they liked doing before. And they're like, whoa, I'm, I'm better, better at, at all these yeah. things. And I'm yeah. like, dude, your movement quality improved. You found sure. balance. Your stamina is better. I mean, those are all important things that even if we hate them, I mean, yeah. I, you were in seventh group, right? Yeah. Seventh group's not a running breeds cowardice SF group, is it? <laughs> no, no, that's more of a uh, it's third group. It's, yeah, like. it's some little fifth. <laughs> uh, I hear that sometimes. Yeah, I mean it's it's thrown around a bit, but uh, yeah, I mean, well, I grew up in the time when whatever your team sergeant was good at, that's what you were going to be good at, right? Yep. If, I think if you, that, that time still exists. Uh, it does to a certain <laughs> extent, but I, I think I think that's where we get culturally a little bit better, right? Where we start like some people. I get I get a lot of frictions at times with like you know. <clears throat> I always say like no generation of SF guys or anything, no generation thinks the guys and gals coming behind them are worth a crap, right? Like every generation is like these new kids, like there's these old, you know, awesome quotes from like right before World War II where they're like, this new generation is like, you know, slovenly and lazy and whatever. And then they become the greatest generation and fight World War II and everything, right? Well, it's the same thing for us, right? And we get, we get a lot of fr friction because like, hey, we're going to embed some of these resources and some of this proactive model into the Q course. And people are like, well, that's going to make it easier for them to pass. And I'm like, yes, yes, it's going to make it easier for them to pass and then easier for them to continue to be on it team to be effective to what we need them to do. And eventually we'll get to the point where like training smarter and using those, uh, those, you know, uh, Thor three or Perez or whoever trainers that you have, like, cool. Using that is normal. And you don't feel like as a team star and I've got to be like, okay, I guess I'm just going to pull something out of my uh, rear today for us to do. Like, no, we, uh, people know how to do this. Like you bring in an expert to teach you a lot of times, like to how to knock off another half second on the pro timer in shooting, why yep. wouldn't you also try to take expert advice in all of these other, not just in physical, why, why are you afraid to go and talk to somebody 
who literally has devoted their life to making sure people can perform better cognitively and mentally. Like, well, let's be, let's be real too. <laughs> Just because you went through the special forces Q course doesn't mean you know shit about being fit. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I look yeah, at the, I'm the guy, I look at the yeah. guys that was that me through right now. That was me. And I'm like the, the level of physical fitness from guys. And, and this isn't yeah. me being generationally. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think there's a pendulum sure. in an institution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like when you and I came through yeah. like that time frame, Sopsy was huge. That's we where were, I came from. Yep. Yeah. We, yeah. we were indoctrinated yeah, yeah, yeah. into fitness by guys who are absolute studs. Yeah. And they were like, this is how you train. I got do crushed. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just destroyed us. Yeah. And it was great. Yeah. But I obviously it was so hard that a lot of guys were like, well, that was just during Sopsy. I don't do yeah. that all the time. Yeah. So they started to lean more and more towards, hey, you already know how to do it. So every guy wanted to work out on his own. Yep. And guys worked out on their own, but then they didn't mentor the yeah. newer guys on how to work out on their own when Sopsy became less yeah. of a focus on just physical fitness and more on like preparing a guy for the whole sure. entirety of the Q course. Yeah. And so now we're seeing guys that really don't know how to be fit. They go to work out on their own. They're not doing something effective. They are eating poorly. Sure. And now you're like, oh, you came out of the Q course 60 pounds overweight. What wow. is going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. You you met the standard, you graduated, congratulations, yeah. but you're a sad human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now we're seeing teams go back to team PT, sure. like mandatory structured stuff yeah. because they want to get guys back into shape. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, Hey, the resources are there. Podif is putting a ton of great stuff out, but if you don't use those resources as yeah. an individual, then you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. You know? Yeah, hundred percent. And I and I guess I'll we'll walk back and make sure that the point I was making is not that we should necessarily go to the PT because I was that guy. Like I I I look back now and realize that injury prevention I didn't do a good job of, which is why I ended up with a lot of the spinal stuff. Right, like I'm in permanent ruck position all the time in my T spine because I didn't do a good job of proactively working on some of those things. Right. And so accessory work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't do accessory work. I didn't do those. I did the things that I thought I needed to do to be really good at the job, but then I'm stuck in those positions and that's not the, that's not the best way to be. I'm not saying at all that, that team PT is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. I think in fact, I went downhill when I went to PTing on my own, as I look back with the sort of prerogative finger on myself, like looking back, I was better. A lot of us did. Yeah, I was better when not. I was forced, even though it was like team start roulette of like, oh man, I still was better and you had more camaraderie. We talked to Ani Retkowski in, in last season, who's the POTIF director for AFSOC. She's an Ironman triathlete and all these things. And she, she made a great point of like, yeah, I always talk about like trying to, you know, leaders are like, oh, I have a trouble like getting to know my people on a deeper level and whatever. And she's like, have you tried just like, you know, spending the first hour working out with them uh, and, and really having shared experience and building that camaraderie because That's we've how gone I build my relationships yeah. with my partner force every time we've, we go in. Yeah. We've pushed out PT. Yeah. We've pushed yeah. it out and, and I got worse, right? I was not a guy. I did. I, I, I relied on my youth and my ability to like, Oh yeah. Hey, you've been able to grit everything out. And I didn't like, I needed a, uh, a more prescriptive, like, Hey, this is, I needed this soft leap plan that I was going to do this. Right. Uh, when well, I was in that mid checks look like too, right? Yeah. Matt? Like that's the thing as a yeah. leader, it's, la it's easy to get lazy because of all the other responsibilities we yeah. have, but exactly. in the end, yeah. you know, your guys are doing the right thing, yeah. but it doesn't mean you stop checking in yeah. to see yeah, yeah, yeah. that they're doing the right thing. And sometimes they're not doing the right thing. Yeah. And it's like, Hey, uh, let's take a second, you know, like yeah. the team that I'm on, well, the team I just left, cause I just got, I just moved to the B team. Yeah. Um, I'm the most senior Bravo and Charlie in the company. And it was pretty hard to avoid <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yep. when that happens. Yep. And, um, they, uh, that my old team, like we would go to mountain training stuff and we climb for 12 or 14 hours yep. and we come back to the, the hooch and my whole team would go to the gym. Yeah, yeah, and I would literally be like, "Hey guys, we just worked out for twelve or fourteen hours." And they're like, yeah, but we didn't. Lift yeah, but weights. we didn't get our gym in. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, "All right." Okay. And you know what? I mean, we had a lot of freedom with which to, like, depending on how you felt, sure, the yeah, guys yeah. got to train how they wanted. Sure. But I think that it's important for guys to realize that, like, that just because I mean, I came to SF because I thought I was going to have a ton of autonomy, and I did. Yeah. yeah. But I also think that. It, that autonomy is dependent on performance. If guys are really, yeah. if they're doing well and taking care of themselves and you, I mean, I think mental health problems are yeah. a bellwether of other things. Like it sure. starts with physical yep. degradation. Start. Then That's you, where it started drinking. for me. Yep. It started yeah. in physical. Yep. 
Yeah. And once you once it starts to go downhill, then other problems start to pop up. And a guy will act like we never saw it coming. I don't yeah. know why this dude painted the wall yeah. with you know his brains. Yeah. And you're like, I do, because for the last three years, he's been struggling with a whole bunch of things. And you guys have just been telling him to be tougher. Yeah. And there are ways to address these things without being just simply tougher. Smarter goes a lot further than just being tougher. Yeah. And whether that be you or me or anybody in this space, I think that the migration towards holistic fitness yeah. and incorporating the psychology and the you know medical health with your physical fitness, I, I don't know why we hadn't done it before, but... Yeah. <laughs> Well, it because like yeah, real- hard, hard and dumb was, uh, was the way to go. Right. I mean, and yep. here's the thing, like we can get in, like we're, we're about coming up on the end of our time. So I don't want to even uncrack the, the Pandora's box. That is like, there's a huge argument on, you know, uh, are we going to lose the grit that is necessary if we make it less about manufactured stress and all those other things. Right. And so I will say there's a balance to all of it. I think we were we were tilted in the other direction. We're going to be as hard as we possibly can because we joined during GY and war was going on and all those things. And I think I th- I don't I am not saying we should manufacture or not manufacture stress or we should make it easy and that it should be a non attrition qualification course. I'm not that guy, right? I'm still Agreed. an Me old either. dude, and <laughs> I still want everybody to have to be hard as woodpecker lips when they come out of there. But I would like them the opportunity to make sure that we give them a little better education so that as they get older and they do have some of that latitude to where they're making better decisions than I made. I can only go from my own experience of looking back at myself and wishing I could go back and jerk myself up on some of those things like, hey, man, you don't realize this now, but you are setting a foundation that's going to become service-connected injury later uh, from overuse. Capacity is yeah. built over 20 or 30 years. It's not built overnight. Yeah. Yeah. So like we send people to selection and we test them to see if they have the capacity to endure suffering and yeah. if they have the ability to think under pressure. Right. And once we've determined that, and I, I know as someone who taught at SWIC for a while, yeah, yeah. like this is a very unpopular opinion amongst <laughs> cadre. But my personal opinion is once you've assessed that that person has that capacity and it's not a hundred percent, like I don't think selection does a perfect job no, of picking no, the right guys. Yeah, nobody so there's sure. going to be some attrition throughout sure. the course as guys demonstrate yeah. their true selves, Yeah, but it's on the cadre to yeah. mold, mentor and grow that capacity in those guys yeah. and say, Hey, you know what? Like you're having a problem here. Um, it's not going to get fixed overnight, but let's talk about a, a path to yeah. what a better solution looks like. And when a guy falls flat on his face, we should take it as a sign of a failure to mentor that guy. Yeah, We should, I mean, maybe we can't save him, right. but we should at least make a mental note that whatever path we put him on might not have been the right one. Yeah. And um, like, I think that if we would, if self-awareness was a more commonly taught tool <laughs> sure. in yeah. this, I think that fitness, mental health, all of those things yeah. would go a lot further. And honestly, I think that those tools are in place or being put in place now with what you're doing. And I'm really excited about what the future looks like. We're way further along than we were 10 yeah. years ago. Well, the fact that we're having these conversations is a great uh, thing. And it's not just a conversation. Like we're having this conversation because I was aware of like all the incredible things you guys were doing, right? It's not like it's just a conversation. Like this is a conversation but, born of like, okay, hey, there's a lot of people that are really passionate and are devoting their lives to trying to fix these problems. And it's not just in the idea stage. Like these resources exist right now as you're listening to this podcast. It's not like we should figure out a way to be better at this. Like, are we perfect in any of these organizations? No, but there's a lot more uh, opportunity to go out and, and the find solution, the right way. Yeah. The solution isn't decided, right? Either. Sure. It's the yeah, whole, yeah. like, if I've seen further, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. There yeah. are people who've been doing this before us. Oh, yeah. There 100%, are going to be people yeah. who far exceed our efforts in yeah, the future. 100%. Yeah. And I mean, when a robot suit comes down and you don't even have to be in shape anymore, <laughs> it's going to be a great day. <laughs> Sign know? me up. I wanted to go to the Space Force because uh, with all my neck and back stuff, there's no gravity there. And then I realized I was just going to have to serve on Earth and that kind of sub-zeroed it for me. But yeah, once no they doubt. get the the robot suit where you uh, you know just move around and do whatever you want to do, uh, I still think there will, uh, you know, we joke, but I still think there'll be a huge 
need for physical fitness even then because uh, what happened to me is through injury, lack of being able to physically burn stress and be able to do some of those things, 100% started a chain fire into mental health and everything else, right? And so well, physical fitness is yeah. a core part of mental yeah. health, but also if like a lot of us, we put an over exaggerated yeah. amount of focus on it, yeah. it can be a detriment as well, sure. right? Yeah. So like a couple beers isn't bad, 20 beers is bad. Yeah. Fitness yeah. is the same way. Like yeah. I'm working and I'm building up uh what I I'm, I'm working towards where I want to be fitness wise. And that is a, you know, that is a yeah. parabola. There are highs and lows and accepting that will leave you in a better mental position. But also like there are so many different pieces that we've ignored. I think it's really great that we're looking at it more holistically and saying, hey, uh, you know, you can be doing all the right things you're told to do and still be suffering because there's there's elements you're ignoring. So just awareness of those elements goes a long way in helping guys address it. And I hope that the the military continues to allow the expansion of resources in those yeah. places. Cause I know, you know, the biggest complaint with Thor three when I was in was that there weren't enough Thor three coaches, there yep. wasn't enough equipment in the gym. Yep. And I'm like, that's because you're looking at it as a sole resource. Yeah, that's true. Too. Yeah. I understand that if you want to go down to behavioral health and see a psych, you might be on a weird weight unless you just tell them you want to kill yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But it's on you to go to one source yeah. and find a counselor or therapist to talk yeah. to and be like, hey, this is what's going on. Or go to an inflict, resources. go to focus, yep. go to the, like, yeah, there's, there's, uh, you know, it, it's, there's, there's a thousand different like lenses through which personal accountability is part of it. Right. And you never want to say that as a leader because it, it seems like you're like pushing the problem down on the people who need the help. But as I've seen, like, again, I'm trying to be very open about how much of a dumpster fire I was in some ways, right? And and I realized that there was a lot of resources available for me in a lot of different places, both at 7th Group and both here at the headquarters, that I was completely just like walking past with no awareness. Uh, you know, I was in a leadership position. I was telling other people, like, hey, these resources are available, and I wasn't availing myself of them, right? And so well, then we once you we become ready the for them, well, well. But sometimes there's a there's a magnet there there's a there's a poster or whatever that you walk by in the gym every day and you don't have that great awareness of it. But once you decide it's time that you want to take advantage of it, a lot of guys' first move and this was my move is like we don't have anything and they're like hold on Skippy like check out yep. all of this infrastructure like let's do it. But to your point, like you may have to you may have to go past the first hurdle and you've done that in your entire career. Right. So don't be afraid to be tenacious about seeking the care you need and finding it where you where you got to find it. I talk to dudes on my Instagram account and phones all the time at like two or three in the morning. Yeah. I'll get weird calls from guys. They'll try to use a fake name yeah. and be like, I don't want to get in trouble. And I'm like, yeah. look, dude, first of all, <laughs> like I'm never going to dime you out. But like you need these services. Yeah. And I'm going to I'm going to write an email right now. I'm going to link you up with like five right. different people. And, uh, you know, not all of them are a good fit for you, but I'll let you make that choice. And I think that, I think honestly, the more as an institution, we push that kind of like community driven solution and be like, Hey, yeah. the answers exist internally in our organization. Yeah. Um, but you gotta, a, you gotta say, I need help yeah. and B you need to be able to go to the professionals that you guys are providing yeah. and trust that they know what they're talking about right. and yeah. do the work, you know? And I think yeah. that when we get to that point, I mean, yeah. we'll be out of a job. Yeah, well, that would be a great point, though, right? I, I will, I will just, I'll, I'll wrap it up with one last thing on that, which is, do better than me, and don't wait until you're at a red line incident to then try to find those resources. Right? I know it seems like so hard to understand when you're in the weeds and you're a young E6 and you're running around and everything is awesome. But like, just open your eyes just slightly to having a contingency plan. Right? You have a contingency plan, and almost everything else you do. Just look at like, okay, hey, maybe I want to just maybe at least know where um, – I want to know where that resource is. I want to know how to get in touch with it. If for no other reason to help your buddies because SOF is a community of I will give you my shirt uh, – the shirt off my back. I will help everybody, but nobody will actually take the help, right? That's that's one of our core issues, right? So we've got – I don't need it. Yeah, we've got a thousand <laughs> – we've got a – I will help anybody in the world – 
but I don't know how uh, I, I won't actually ask for the help myself, right? And so, Doug, I can't thank you enough, man. Uh, such an awesome uh, opportunity. I could talk to you for another three hours. Uh, the opportunity I, was mine. I really appreciate you inviting me to be on here. It was super awesome. I uh, I don't know if this is making it, but it sure feels like it, so I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't know about that, man. I feel like making it to have you uh, have you come on and talk this stuff, man. I know how passionate you guys are, and I know how much, and, and again, like I said from the beginning, no implicit endorsement of any profit or nonprofit. We just want you to go out there. I know Doug wants you to go to Softly, and I got that, right? But I want you to just go out there at SOCOM. We want you to you want you to get the help you need in all five of those domains, physically, spiritually, emo- or psychologically, cognitively, and in your social and family relationships. And uh, I just want to say, everybody out there that's listening, appreciate you joining us uh, here for another episode of Softcast. Go and rate and review uh, on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find it. And, uh, and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, and if you got any ideas or if there's some kind of feedback or something you want to see, hit us up, softcast at SOCOM.mil. So on behalf of General Clark, everybody here at US SOCOM, thanks for listening to another episode of Softcast. Softcast.